Jackie Smith. We're now recording. Welcome to S. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jackie, where are you? <laughs> I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> Oh, it's funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my bedroom too. I'm in a little village called Durrington, which is near Stonehenge, right. uh, near Sol Salisbury in Wiltshire. I know it very well. Now, Jackie, one of the most famous skydivers in the world, one of the most well-known skydivers and parachutists ever. As we're recording this, it's International Women's Day, so happy International Women's Day. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's fantastic. Now, you got into the Hall of Fame in 2013, but something happened last week. You've got the T-shirt. Tell me what's happened. Uh, yeah, I, I was made an ambassador of the International Skydiving Museum and uh, Hall of Fame and uh, received my T-shirt. So I've, I've got a white one and a red one there, and I'm an ambassador. And it's to uh, remember the past of skydiving, parachuting as we called it, and to inspire the um, future uh, sport of skydiving and promote the uh, International uh, Museum, which isn't, bu isn't built yet, but uh, hopefully, you know, soon it will be in Florida somewhere. Yeah, I was reading a bit about that as well and the ongoing um situation with raising money and getting it in place. You got inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2013. Uh, yes. I was there actually when it happened. How did that happen? How did you become aware of that? Uh, well, I received a phone call from uh, John Hitchin yeah. and uh, I was over the moon because, you know, I, I'd been uh, inducted into the Skydiving Hall of Fame. I was over the moon as well. And um, yeah, and then um, flew to Chicago, went to Skydive Chicago and um, had just an, amaz an amazing time. Um, you know, what an honour to stand up and, and, you know, it's like you stand there and, and it was Pat Thomas and uh, John Smythe and Kurt Curtis introduced me, fantastic introduction. I got a standing ovation, then I had to go up onto the stage and uh, put my, my blazer on and um, and then make a speech. And um, yeah, I, I got a standing ovation because I knew practically everybody that was in the audience anyway. You know, I, I'd skydived with some style and accuracy and relative work as we called it then. So um, yeah, it was just amazing. It was, it was the icing on the cake at the time. And just amazing, yeah. What an incredible career, what a trailblazer you have been, not only in the sport of parachuting and skydiving, but for women in general in sports as well, and especially in the armed forces. Let's go all the way back to when it started, Jackie. I know before you joined the army, you are already athletic, you were swimming, and what were you doing yeah. before, you joined the army, before you joined the army? Well, I came from humble beginnings. I, you know, I was raised on a, a council estate up north, um, and no, not many prospects. Um, during my school life, I, you know, I did my Duke of Edinburgh's award. I uh, did trampolining. I used to swim. Uh, the Eston Baths was opened. My local swimming pool opened, and and I, I used to go to the baths every night. We used to call it the baths. It was a swimming pool, and um, they. Um, put diving boards in and uh, I was the first person to dive off the top board you know it's, it's quite daunting to, to dive off the off the springboard the second board um, but yeah I used to dive and swim I used to swim competitively I used to swim at the uh, for the school at Yorkshire for Yorkshire um, North Yorkshire um, competitions and everything um, yeah, and I was sports mad, I used to play around us and everything. And then my ambition was to join the army to be a physical training instructor because, you know, I was sports mad. And um, I, I went to the recruiting office in Middlesbrough uh, before I was 17 years old and I did all of the, uh, the paperwork and the interviews and everything, the medical. And I actually joined the army three days after my uh, 17th birthday 
and uh, I went to uh, Guildford in Surrey to do my basic training where you learn to, to march and salute. You know, I used to salute everybody just in case I forgot to salute the correct person. So I was saluting private soldiers and, and um, yeah, and um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed my uh, uh, my first two years in the army, and I got posted to Aldershot. I was too young to go abroad. You had to be seventeen years and ten months to be posted abroad. And when I was at Catrick, after I'd done my Royal Signals training, I had to go into a trade for a year before I could go to the PT school, because you can't go to the PT school because you achieve sergeant status straight away and, and, and you can't but you can't be a sergeant bossing people about if you've got really no experience of, of the army so i went into royal signals was posted to aldershot and um it was that's where the parachute regiment were based that's where the whole of the british airborne was based and um and that was where it all started off really how did you realised that you wanted to try parachuting. parachuting. Was, it, was it in your mind before you went there or was it? No, was it... no, I, I didn't even know parachuting existed. I, um, where I worked in in um, HQ South East District, which was the headquarters, um, right across the road was Depot, the parachute regiment, um, Browning Barracks. And I used to play badminton. I, I played lead badminton for the Depot Para. I was on the mixed doubles team. And so I got to know a load of the airborne soldiers and some of the officers that worked in the... Um, at, at Depot Para, but just be, the other side of the canal was Queen's Avenue, where they used to have a barrage balloon, and it was um, th that's where the airborne used to go and do their seven military drops before they actually went and did their eighth jump from an aeroplane. And I used to sit underneath of the barrage balloon watching them jump in and. You know, they were 400 feet above the ground, tethered by, uh, you know, a big vehicle with a big coil on it. And I used to lay down next to the vehicle. And when they jumped out of the balloon, they uh, they were like a, a small dot to start off with. But then I could read the tread on the bottom of their boots because they were getting closer and closer. And then the parachute would open and it would just breathe. And then they would land right around me. And, and I thought, Wow, I've got to have some of this. And so I, um, you know, I went back to my company office and said to the, the clerk, I'd like to do a, I'd like to do a parachuting course. And I thought that I was doing a parachuting course to do that, to jump out of the barrage balloon. I didn't know I didn't know free fall existed. And um, I was told that it was only men that did that. So I kept on pestering them and saying, I, you know, I really want to do this parachuting class, course because I'd done advanced swimming course. I could swim anywhere, but I, every sporting course that there was available in the army, I, I put my name down for. And um, eventually they allowed me to go. The, the, they allowed four girls to go. And um, one of them was Tina Siddle, who's still a friend of mine. She's air traffic control at Netherhaven after all these years. Oh. Uh, Rowena Bazell, she was a, a medic, and another girl, I can't remember her name. And um, for three weeks before we went to Netherhaven, we went into depot the parachute regiment um, Browning Barracks to learn how to pack parachutes. We did PLFs and um, emergency procedures. We did all of our ground training over like three weeks. We did it. We, we, we all could pack parachutes before we even went to Netherhaven. And then on the 26th of March, which is another couple of weeks time, we uh, drove, drove down to Netherhaven in the back of open three tonners. It was freezing cold because it was just coming out of winter. And um, we, um, we were accommodated. Four of us girls wouldn't, weren't allowed to be accommodated at Netherhaven because no females were allowed on the camp. 
Can you believe it? Oh, so, yeah, so we had to be ferried over to Lark Hill where there was a Women's Royal Army Corps accommodation block. And so we had to be ferried, you know, back and forth. And then we, on the, the it was um, the 26th of March, we did some more um, exit practice and ground training. And then they called the manifests for the next day when we were about to jump. And um, they put me first, didn't they? You know, because they were, they, 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 um, I suppose the psychology of it all was put a female first. And, 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 and if the female goes first, the rest of the blokes, uh, they, they, they're not going to drop out, are they? They're not going <laughs> to say that. Oh, I'm not going to do it because, you know, they, 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 they'd never live, would they? No. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, the 27th of March, 1971, at Sparrow's Fart, you know, very early o'clock in the morning, um, I was I was on the first lift and that was my first flight as well. I'd, I'd never flown before. I'd never been in an aeroplane. So um, it was all just overwhelming. It was just such a, a, a new experience and I loved it. <laughs> So 50 years, 50 years this month. Yeah, 50 years on the 27th of March this year. 50 oh, years. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And so you started <laughs> jumping in. Were you doing this as a, this was sport? This was not actually in the parachute regiment? No, no, this was, um, uh, this was sport parachuting. Um, yeah. I, I, I went on a basic um, parachuting course, sport parachuting course at Netherhaven. It was a 15 jump course. It was a, a taster to see if you liked it. I absolutely loved it. And, and um, everything I'd ever done previous to this just fell by the wayside, you know. I mean, I still did play badminton. I still went swimming, but it it wasn't dominant in my life like this parachuting was. And, um, and then as soon as the course had finished, I um, enrolled on an advanced course, um, which was about two weeks later. And at that, I did uh, a night jump. I, I got into free fall, obviously, um, started progressing. You know, you, you were allowed to do more things than you were as a, as a basic student. And I just loved it, absolutely loved it. And then shortly after that, uh, it was the Army Championships in the May. I started jumping in the March yeah. and the, the, May the 14th, I think, was the Army Championships. And um, I entered the novices event in accuracy and uh, jumping a C9 double L, um, a B4 backpack, a big low slung um, reserve, front mount reserve. Um, I think I had cross pull. I've got lots of photographs with cross pull, and um, massive. It was a massive harness, uh, but but not no padding on it. And uh, it, you know, I think throughout my my early days when I was jumping a B4 backpack, my body was covered in bruises. Uh, just from the, just from wearing the harness, I, I, I used to take the harness off at the end of the day, and it looked like I still had a, a harness on because it was just a bruise, you know, where where the um, where the harness used to be. And um, yeah, I entered the Army Championships Novices event, and I won the novice. I, I won it. I, I, you know, I beat people in this in that were in the novices event that were jumping much higher performance canopies than me like para commanders i mean i say high performance they're not high performance as we class them today but they were compared yeah. to a c9 double l which was yeah. just a basic parachute limited maneuverability and uh, yeah and i landed in the pit i landed i landed right in the center of the pit on every jump um so yeah i was um and, and everybody was saying, oh, Jackie Smith, it's a female, you know, because there wasn't very many females at the time. And the press were all over me like a cheap suit because I was a female sort of breaking through this into this all male environment. And uh, yeah, my life just took off from there, really. It's, you know, the sky wasn't the limit, you know, <laughs> it, it just went on and on and on. How many jobs did you have then in that first competition when you entered that novice? I think 24. Uh, yeah, I did 15 on my basic course and then because of the weather, you know, we have really bad weather in the UK. Um, I think by the time I'd done the advanced course, it, it might have been, 
Yeah, it was it was twenty four jumps, twenty four jumps. And I did the because um, we did. We, I think the advanced course was fifteen jumps. We did, but we didn't do fifteen jumps, you know. And then but shortly the, after, at yeah, the time, on. then you were still. What was your job then? I was still in the Royal Signals, you were still in, the uh, in, in the women's army, uh, yeah. based uh, based at Aldershot, and. Yeah. Um, I passed my driving test um, and, and I bought a little, little cheap Austin, Austin, I can't remember what it was, but uh, he asked to drive down to Netherhaven every Friday night, raring to go. In the women's army at the time, we, we, we weren't allowed to stay out overnight. We had to uh, we had to book in every night. If we went down the pub in Aldershot on a, during the week, we had to check in uh, into the guard room. We had to check in and check out. If we wanted to go away for a weekend, we weren't allowed to unless we put in a weekend application pass and that had to be signed for one of the higher ranking officers that you could go away and, and, and you had to justify why you were being out of camp. The men could go away and do anything that they wanted, but there were so many restrictions on females, even in the army, even in those days. So yeah, I used to get a weekend pass and then drive down to Netherhaven um, I don't think the A303 was even built then, and uh, it used to take me ages to get there. And then once I was at Netherhaven, I wasn't allowed to stay on the camp again. And sometimes I used to park my car at the sergeant's mess and try and sleep in the back of the car, but then the guards used to come round and knock on the window and tell me to get off camp. They wouldn't allow females to stay on the camp. It's so I used to drive... It's unbelievable. It's no, I... No, and I used to drive down to the lay-by outside the, on the A345, which is on the main road, just outside of Netherhaven, and sleep in my car on, on the, on the, in the lay-by. But I wasn't allowed to sleep anywhere on the camp, because, and I didn't have anywhere else to sleep, because I hadn't booked accommodation at uh, Lark Hill, where the Women's Royal Army Corps block was. Uh, yeah, there were so many things that I had to get through as a female because it was just it was just an all male um, world at the time I never made a fuss about it I, you know I, I've never been a feminist I've never beat up men I, it was just the institutions that were always in place that stopped women doing what I wanted to do it's almost hard to believe. We've come a long way, haven't we, in equality so far? Oh, but wow. just amazing. Just amazing. Yeah, just amazing. I could tell you so many stories about not being able to do things uh, yeah. because I wasn't allowed to because I was a female. But you were the first woman to... I mean, when you... From the signals, what happened next? So well, the uh, story you tell after, after the Army Championships, um, and, you know, I was suddenly... The press were on to me, and so was the army press. And I was suddenly, the, 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 everybody was aware of me, I suppose, and, and I was a female. And um, and then Alex Black used to be a captain in the Royal Engineers, and he was the Airborne Engineers, 9 Squadron at Aldershot. And uh, he asked me if I would do some demos for him through the summer. And so um, my 32nd and 33rd jump, I jumped out of a scout helicopter with smoke, with a C9 double L and a B4 backpack into the Royal Engineers passing off parade in Southwood camp, small field and uh, surrounded by loads and loads of people and uh, you know, all of the families of the, of the young lads that were passing up, passing off, bless yeah. you. You're cool. and, uh, <laughs> And um, yeah, we, we, we jumped on the first jump and landed in the arena. And then it, all I could hear, it was like a buzz of, it's a girl, it's a girl, it's a girl on the team, it's a girl on the team. And everybody wanted my autograph. And we packed our parachutes just on the edge of the field. And, and, and everybody was around us like, it's a girl, it's a girl. Can I have your autograph, missus? Can, you have, can I have your autograph, missus? And we packed our parachutes and then we got back in the scout helicopter and sat on the on the edge of the 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 floor of the, the helicopter with our feet on the skids and we took off from the arena which I, I have such a vivid image because when the helicopter took off all of these women were all dressed up with lovely flouncy dresses on and everything and and when the helicopter took off 
All you could see was the uh, the, the dresses were like above above their shoes, <laughs> <laughs> and you could see their pants. You could see their knickers. <laughs> And you had all these scre screaming women running around going, whoa, you know. But we, but we took off and we did the second jump uh, into the arena. And and again, everybody was just like, oh, it's a girl, it's a girl on the team. How do you get to, to parachute? You know, and, and I could see straight away it was, it was the best form of uh, recruiting for the sport because everybody... I suppose if it was just the blokes there, they, they didn't sort of approach the blokes because the the, blo the blokes in their army no, uniform. No don't, of course, there, were, there was no. Um, I, I suppose there was a little bit of fear as well because some of the blokes were, you know, officers or sergeants and that in the Royal Engineers. Whereas I was just a, a girl on the, you know, how do you get to do it? How did you get to? How do you learn to parachute? Where do you go to? Because nobody knew then. It wasn't main, mainstream sport. Yeah. And um, and then um, yeah, and then Major Schofield, who was the team commander of the Red Devils, I was still on the switchboard working at in Royal Signals in Aldershot, and he phoned me up and he said um, he, uh, he he asked me to go to the team room, which was just across the road, really, and uh, he he asked me not to do any more parachuting displays with the Royal Engineers. I did do some more parachute displays. I did a couple of donkey derbies and a, a few flower shows. And um, and then Major Schofield said that he had some plans for me, but he didn't know. He didn't want to tell me what the plans were. But he also invited me to jump with the team on a Monday afternoon and a Wednesday afternoon at Blackbush Airport. So he wrote to my boss in the Women's Army and she allowed me to be off from my Royal Signals work, Mondays and Wednesdays. And then at the weekends, I did ground party for the team for uh, a whole year, I traveled around the country with them. So I got to, I got to know, you know, the, 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 the format for a parachute display. You know, I used to lay out the, the, um, the map, the um, cross in the DZ and, we had radios then. We didn't have um, ground-to-air communication, you know. So if, the, if there was, the, if they were jumping, uh, if they were flying in, and they were too early for our P hour, parachute hour, our time that we had to be in in the arena, uh, our only means of communication was, was the cross. And so instead of making the, the, the fluorescent orange uh, cross into a cross, we used to put into a T formation. And that, uh, and that meant that they uh, they they could see us from up uh, up above, and they would just fly around and fly around. Because sometimes there was other sh shows on in the arena, like horse show, or if it was an agricultural show, they might be having problems getting the cows out. And then there was cow pats everywhere and yeah. horse poo, you know, in the arena. Um, and so not until the arena was clear, we and then we I'd put the cross out like the flare. And then that was an indication to the um, to the jumpers in the aircraft, the jump master, to uh, come in and jump. And yes, yeah, so for a whole year, I travelled around the country every weekend, and it, it was long, long hours. You know, they, they, sometimes the team would jump five, six demos in a day, and and then the, the DZ party had to, as soon as they they jumped and packed, we had to get in the DZ van and the vehicle and drive off to the next arena to set it up for the next show so um but i loved it i just loved it so a year of that but then you were actually in the team jumping wasn't yeah it? yeah i was I, I was allowed to jump uh you know mondays and wednesday afternoon and then obviously that the, well the team used to have a drop zone on queen's avenue in aldershot and um, after Blackbush, and I used to go down there after work or any time I could, and and jump and get to Netherhaven and jump. I just, I, I just loved it. You know, I just was, just loved it with a passion. I couldn't get enough of it. I lived it, ate it, slept it, dreamt it, nightmared about it. <laughs> I used to wake up thinking I was in free fall. I just loved the sport. You know. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then. You're in the team, you're competing, and then we have the, the World Championships in 78. 
Yeah, well, um, what, to get me onto the team was all the time that during that first year, Major Schofield was writing to my Queen Bee and all of the hierarchy in the in the army to try and get me allow, uh, allowed to join the team full time. Um, and, and there I came across a lot of barriers, not only from the male institutions, but from the, the, the female institutions as well. I mean, my, my Queen Bee in the Women's Royal Army Corps uh, didn't want me to join the team because they were worried that the public would be able to see up my skirt when I went overhead when I was jumping on arenas as if I wore a skirt when I was jumping on, you, you yeah. know, uh, wow. and, and it took a year of, well, it, it took all of that year of letter writing to allow the, allow me to join the team. But they, they let me go and um, I officially joined the team in February, February the 12th, 1972, I was officially a full-time, fully-fledged member of the Red Devils, yeah. That yeah. was less than a year from your first job. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it took them all that time, you know, from, from like the, the, the summer onwards to, to write. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I, was, I joined the team uh, and, and it was a big press day. They had the TV there, and, and, and um, that's I, I've got thousands of photographs because my whole life has been catalogued right from my first jump. Just because there's always been press there everywhere we went. And because I was a female, I, you know, I had all of the, the press hanging around me. They were uh, they were like bees around the honey. Yeah. <laughs> What an incredible experience for you, Jackie. It was, yeah, it was. Well, that's what you knew. You didn't know anything else, really. You know, you didn't live yeah. any other life, did you? So it's... No, no, it was just amazing. And and the lads were great. Um, in the parachute regiment, I think um, I think some people were frightened that they would... They, they, they didn't... They don't. They didn't want anybody in the in the regiment that wasn't airborne. You know, they're, they're very proud and we've got this brotherhood. Um, but because I was on the Red Devils and I was quite high profile and I was doing so much for the publicity for the Red Devils and the Women's Royal Army Corps and the Parachute Regiment, because everything I did reflected on the Parachute Regiment. So, um, you know, I, I was in a position where I could have been a naughty girl, you know, there was all these men and um, I could have got a bad reputation and, and uh, you know, it would have been all in the newspapers and everything. But um, yeah, so I had to, I had to play a, a very clever media game. Yeah. I, 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 knew, I knew what they were after all the time because I was the only girl on the team. They, they used to ask me questions like, where do you get changed? Where, where where do you get undressed? Or where where do you sleep? Do you sleep with the men? You know, there was all there were always there was always like a lead in yes. to find out where the where, where I fitted in into this this male world. And uh, I I didn't give them anything you know sordid. I didn't give them anything that they wanted to write about because you know they, uh, they, they I think they wanted some sensational. Yeah. story about you know jackie slept with eight red devils last night <laughs> well, as well in them days you, you wouldn't have had a really i would imagine you didn't have like a media team coaching you on what to no, say no. you just had to work no. it all out for yourself no not at all yeah. no i just had to be very careful everything that i said to the press i had to be very careful about because i knew they would twist it um even it i remember one interview um um one of the, the press, I think it was the Daily Telegraph, said to Major Schofield, oh, does Jackie drink? Does she drink with the blokes? And Major Schofield said, oh, yeah, she drinks 10 pints of Guinness every night and smokes a pipe. Well, the press, they printed it, you know, and they, they put. And at that time, that was sort of not very good, you know, it wasn't a good image for a woman in the army to be sort of drinking 10 pints of Guinness, you know, and smoking a pipe. And um, and even my dad was upset with the, oh. with the press, when, you know, when, the, when, the, when the, he said, you don't drink 10 pints of Guinness, do you? And I might now, but I didn't. Think. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell, tell, let's get on to 
Yugoslavia. Was it, uh, no, 78, um, like, was yeah. it, uh, where was it? It was uh, the- Yeah, Zagreb, yeah. Zagreb, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, was, I was, when I joined the team, I became a, a firm um, fixture on the competition team. We did do demonstrations as well, but any competitions, um, I went, uh, you know, I, I, I went and competed style and accuracy. And I made my first British team in 1974, um, competing in Zolenok in Hungary, which was be behind the Iron Curtain at the time. And because we were military, we had to get special dispensation to go behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, when we went to um, Hungary, from the moment we arrived in Hungary, we were supervised everywhere we went because we were military and they thought that we were spies so um so that was an experience and um yeah and then i competed again 75 nationals uh 70 uh, sorry uh 76 i was on the british team again style and accuracy with the red devils i think there was three four of us from the red devils on the british team and we went to wadonia in rome and uh, I did really, I did, at 75, I started jumping the square parachute. Uh, transfer, everybody was moving over from um, papillons and, and paracommanders over to um, stratostars with the ropes and rings, you know, with the reefing system. And, um, and then uh, 76, I went to the World of Championships in, in Rome and I did really well, and it was there I realised that I could be world champion. You know, I knew I could do it. I did really well, but I think I had a one metre thirty-one, and yeah. may, as, may as well pack your bags when you get that kind of score. You know, yeah. you don't you don't pack your bags, but you know, you, you, you're out of the running. And then um, I decided at the end of seventy-six that I wanted to uh, be world champion and do my own training because although I was with the Red Devils and jumping as much as I was with them, it wasn't the type of jumping, the consistency I wanted to jump uh, to, be as, to be good enough to win the World Championships. And so I elected to come out of the army in January in 1977. I went to California with symbiosis and I did, I, uh, did eight-way training and uh, made the um, went to the nationals and, and did relative work uh, training in eight way at Pope Valley in California. I think we did three training camps, won the nationals, went to Australia for the world championships in eight way, and we came fourth in in the eight way. But on every jump I did in training, every single jumps, I think I did about 700 jumps in, in that year, 1977, and every single jump I did accuracy on, and I was experiencing different climates, different wind conditions, thermals, clouds, temperatures, which all affect your parachute and, and your accuracy. And then in uh, spring 1978, I went to Rayford in North Carolina, to uh, train accuracy and style uh, with the uh, with Jean Paul Thacker, you know, he, he, he was an amazing, amazing bloke, you know. I mean, I was good at accuracy and I was okay at style. And, and I know he used to laugh at me when I used to do style, you know, I used to, I used to come down after an accuracy jump and I'd get a really good dead centre. And I'd done style before I'd, I'd done the accuracy and I'd walk away from the pit towards him on his telemeters. Yeah. He used to have his arm, he used to have his arm on the telemeters like this, go like shaking his head like, like this yeah. at me, you know, as I was walking back. It didn't matter that I'd got like 60 dead centers back to back. My style wasn't up to scratch, you know, <laughs> and, it, and I, I'd get back to, to the telemeters and Jean Politer. What the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, when we were jumping at uh, Rayford in North Carolina, the um, the team R Rayford Stalin Accuracy team, they, I think they won more World Championships medals than any other team in the world. So all the time that I was training there, they were there as well. Yeah. And so when you're training against the best, you they, they lift you up to to their level and and and. When we went, I came back from uh, 
Rayford to the UK. Nearly didn't get back because at the time, you, you um, I flew out with Freddie Laker. It was really yeah. cheap. It was fifty-four pounds to fly out to to Washington or New York or somewhere like that. And then we had to get cheap flights from from there to uh, Fayetteville. And um, after the training camp in Rayford, we flew to uh, New York and we couldn't pre-book tickets with Freddie Lakey. You had to turn up at the terminal as a first come, first served. And uh, we got to New York, got out of the taxi and the taxi driver drove us around the block and we said, where are you going? He said, oh, the, this is the, the line. The queue is round the block. So he, he dropped us off and uh, Dan Kenny was with me and he, he said, put your bags down here. And he went to the front of the queue and uh, we were three days in the queue waiting to get back to UK. Wow. That was on the Saturday and the Nationals were starting at um, Bridlington on the Thursday night. We're doing the draw, start on the Friday morning. And uh, so I had to sleep on the streets in Queen's Boulevard, which was really, really rough for, th for two nights. The third night we got into the terminal and by the time we got on the aeroplane, we knew everybody around us because we'd, we'd moved oh. into caution. And we stunk to high heavens. There was an ice cream parlor across the road that allowed us to um, use their toilets, yeah. uh, but if it washing and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, won the nationals at uh, Bridlington and then uh, selected for the British team to go out to Zagreb in Yugoslavia. And um, I was I was I was peaking when when I was at Rayford. I was peaking. Uh, my, my ambition was to get. 10 dead centres back to back to fill in 10 lines on my logbook wow. and I was happy and then I'd get to like 27 dead centres and then I'd get 5 centimetres so I knew I was I was I was good enough to get 10 back yep. to back and then went to Zagreb Yugoslavia and um, I think on the first accuracy day I got 5 dead centres and uh, I never look at the scoreboard when I'm competing right. with accuracy because then you start competing against this the scoreboard and and not your own ability and um and every jump was like the first jump you know if i'd get a dead center that was behind me next yeah. jump i just need to get a dead center i never thought forward i never thought back you know i was in the present just focusing on one dead center one dead center at a time yeah. And then it went on and I got to nine dead centres back to back. So I didn't know what anybody else had scored. I didn't need to know. But people were coming back up to me and patting me on the back and saying, oh, I hope you're the first person in the world to get 10 dead centres back to back. And I, I really didn't need it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to think, oh, no, go go away. I, I don't need this. I don't need this. Uh, the, the, pre the pressure was immense because, one, nobody had ever done it before. Yeah. Uh, and two, the whole of the best, the cream of the crop was there, you know. And um, John Meacock used to come up to me and he'd say, look, if there's anything you want, you just tell me and I'll get it for you. And um, and then there was, well, there was two and a half bad days, bad weather days between jump nine and jump ten. Yeah, and I had to sleep on this. I didn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I think I lost about half a stone in those two days. You know, um, I, I really was under immense pressure. I just can't tell you how much the pressure was. And um, but but everybody on the Brit team, they all had their own little superstitions. Like Dane wouldn't shave, and uh, you know, people were wearing the same T-shirts that they'd worn the day before just because they wanted to keep this little superstition going for me. And um, and on the third day, we went out to the drop zone and the, they started off with uh, style because there was like, um, I think there was the, the winds were, were just on the limits for accuracy, kicking above it. So they went into style. And then after about two hours, uh, three hours, it was lunchtime. They said that they were going to do uh, round 10 of the accuracy. So then they threw the wind drift indicator and everybody in accuracy used to go to the, the pit to watch the, the wind, wind, you know, because the wind never flies straight, does it? There's always dog legs and, and it's stronger upstairs or it's stronger downstairs. 
and um, yeah, I went out to the pit and watched the wind drift indicator. And um, then they, they, they called Jacqueline Smith, you know, for round 10 of the ladies' accuracy. And that was like, oh, you know, I was, um, yeah, I was, I, was, I can't tell you what it felt like butterflies in my stomach. Um, I couldn't even do up my, my chest strap. My chest strap. Uh, I was wearing a SST racer at the time. I think I was the only person at the world meet wearing a, a piggyback, uh, you know, uh, with Miss Stratostar in it. Yeah. And um, John Meacock did my chest strap, strap up for me with my altimeter because I, I felt, ooh, I felt the old jitters coming on. And then everybody started coming around me and patting me on the back. And um, I, I just did not need that at all. I just, I, I like to stay in my own zone, quiet. I'm not somebody to shout about, hey, look at me. I just needed to focus and be in my zone. And I um, sat down. I've got a photograph of me just before I unplanned, actually. And I just closed my eyes and shut out the world, put my head down. I was sat on the floor and um, I just, all I could think about was, you know, just zoning on the accuracy. I could see my foot hitting the accuracy, the the, um, the, the, the dead centre. And um, I, I didn't even hear anybody around me. It was like zen. I was in my own place, you know. And then I got into the aeroplane. It was an Antonov and it took, I think, 10 of us or eight of us, nine, because we were light girls. And I was fifth one out. And um, after the first girl got out, I used to watch from the door of the aircraft or the window just to see where her canopy had landed. And um, I saw it land in the middle of the pit. And we used to put one person out at a time. You see, the aircraft did a big, long circuit. And then the next person would jump out. And, um, and then the second girl jumped out. And uh, I watched her canopy. She landed by the side of the pit and I thought, what the hell's going on down there? You know, if the winds got up or has the winds changed around because it was lunchtime and the wind, you know, the wind sock used to do just amazing things. The wind never flies straight and it yeah. never flies constant. It's increasing or decreasing or there's a thermal and right next to the pit. If, if you're downwind of the, the pit, the pit, attracts a lot of heat so that the, the windsock if it's downwind the the thermals on the pit the windsock used to go it would go up in the air and fly that way or whiz round and it wasn't the wind necessarily it was it was the thermal activity that was moving the windsock and um, the third girl got out and she landed at the other side of the pit and then the fourth girl got out, and after the fourth girl got out of the aircraft, the co-pilot came down, and he stood beside me, and he, he cut his throat and went, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Right. And I was supposed to be next out, and I thought, oh, what's going on? Is it windy? Is it, you know, is it thermally? Is the wind change, changed around? And he couldn't tell me what had happened because he couldn't speak English. And... Um, Anyway, we flew around, I'd loosened my chest strap and my, my, I had a frap hat on, loosened it off, <clears throat> uh, took my goggles off and everything, just put it on the back of my head. And um, and then after about 25 minutes, he came back to me and he point, tapped me on the shoulder and he indicated it was time to go. He opened the Antonov door. It's like a big bathroom door, you know. Yeah. And so, um, and he couldn't tell me what had gone on. So I flew in on jump run. Uh, I spotted, gave a couple of corrections and got out of the aircraft. And I could feel my heart beating in my ears. It was like, boom, boom, boom. It was like this, this um, anticipation, if, it's, if you like. I wasn't yes. nervous. And, I, <clears throat> and um, I just got under the canopy and I just took deep breaths. All the time I'd been in the aircraft, I was taking deep breaths and slow blowouts, very deep breaths, calm, calm, calm. And then under the canopy, I just uh, decided to stay close to the pit because if you go out too far from the pit, when you're doing accuracy and you face into wind to get onto the line, we used to call it the wire. 
so that when you set up you're on the wire and you wired in straight down onto the disc um, if i was too far out you don't learn anything about flying your parachute on full flight um, <clears throat> and so you can always skim off the excess altitude if you're too close but if you're too far away and you don't make it back in you, 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 you know, you're lost really. So I set up really high, really hot, close. And um, the windsock was doing all sorts of things. Like I said, it was going up and then it was facing that way. It would whiz around and face the other direction to make it look like I was landing downwind. And um, it faced, the windsock faced me and I, I, I was over the edge of the pit and I felt a a bump of thermal which sort of bumped me off to one side you've got to be on the ball to adjust your correction straight away and i came in and i could feel my left leg my left foot started twitching i was zoned in on on the on the dead center on on, on the center but i could feel my left foot twitching so i put my right foot out next point of contact you know it, it hit the ground my heel my right heel touched the ground the dead center and then my bum hit the ground and then i just sat there looked up at the electronic readout and it said 0. 0.00 oh, oh then, fantastic <laughs> <clears throat> the first time just, in competition i just sat back and and then the whole of the british team came in Dougie Peacock was chief judge, yeah. chief accuracy judge in the pit he was supposed to be watching for the next competitor and yeah. They all came in and picked me up and Dougie Peacock was supposed to be still in the pit as chief judge and he ran out with me, holding <laughs> me in here. <laughs> amazing, what a story. Yeah, well, amazing. Amazing, amazing. Well, I'm out of time, I'm going to have to stop, but it's been brilliant to talk to you. Yeah, it's lovely to speak to you as well. Take care, Jackie. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, thank you.